Chapter 32, Reunion Reunion It was their fourth day in Amkathran, and another bored afternoon found them in the village for what little entertainment could be scratched up, the men sat together on the low wall outside the tavern with Brianna, Fritha and Imoan playing a skipping game with three of the local children, Danvir, and the two sisters Amishi and Kalyani, whose mothers apparently had work serving in the tavern. The Kalimshite influence was strong so close to dessert, the young children playing in their simple long tunics and gathered trousers, the lad Danvir turning the rope they had tied to the remains of the inn's hitching post, Fritha's hand at the jade rope about her neck and Imoen with an arm clamped firmly across her chest, the pair laughing as they skipped. Hollisterling, Kelvin, and Elminster Went to a party with the seven sisters. One wore satin. One wore lace. And one wore nothing but a smile on his face. Rippling laughter from the children about them. I bet it was that old tart, Elminster, huffed Fritha. He's been about more than the planar sphere. Imoen nodded wisely, some quite hard to affect when still jumping. I hear he only went to the hell's cause he heard Succubi will do things you can't pay for. Sing another song! cried Amishi. Fritha puffed a breathless laugh, rolling her eyes at the girl opposite. All right, apples, peaches, pears, and plums, jump in when your birthday comes. Hammer, Alteriac, Ches, Tarsuk, Mert. Kalyani's eager leap stopped the rope dead, much to her older sister's delight. Ha ha, K-A-L, you're out. Let's do another. Came Danvir eagerly. Fritha nodded, all the more exhausted for this sudden respite. Uh, I'll turn rope for a bit, it's too hot here for me. Is it lots colder in the north? Asked Kalyani absently puffing her long fringe from her eyes, with snow and white bears. It's certainly cooler where we're from, but not that cold, it only snows in the winter and you have to go further north for white bears. I wish it would snow here, sighed Amishi. Danvir nodded. My mother said in Kalimport, the rich people eat snow. Eat snow? Don't be silly. They do here in Tether, too, explained Fritha gently. They crush ice and flavor it with syrup. We never get anything like that here, sighed Amishi sulkily. Imoen was suddenly grinning, calling up to the tavern for Minsk to throw her a cup, the girl filling it from her flask to set in on the dusty ground, a finger hurriedly tracing out a few runes about it. Here. Stand back. A clap of her hands, a flash of light and Imoen snatched up the cup, letting a solid lump of ice slide into Danvir's waiting hand. Wow! It's so cold! Make me one! cried Amishi, Imoen letting the girl help her fill the cup again, as Danvir ran the ice up and down his swarthy arm, fascinated as he watched it melt. At Fritha's knees, Kalyani was watching her curiously. Can you do magic, too? Can I do magic? Laughed Fritha. I know spells that would make your hair curl. In fact, I know a spell that would make your hair curl, would you like curly hair? Kalyani giggled. How does it work? Well, said Fritha dropping to a crouch beside her, you section out a piece, like this, and you have to whisper secrets to it, see? They both watched the dark tress twist and curl to leave the girl with a bouncing ringlet. There. And just what have they been whispering to your hair? Fritha whirled at that familiar voice, catching the woman off guard as she threw her arms about her. Jahara. You're back. What's all this? 
the druid laughed as they parted, Fritha's face still shining. Nothing, I just missed you. Jahara! cried Imoen, skipping over to them as well, you're back quick. Aruna used her magics to teleport me. Come, we should speak to the others. Imoen and Fritha bade farewell to the children, the three women walking back up to the tavern together. Minsk was the first to notice their newcomer, his flask offered to her in warm greeting. Ah, good Jahara, you have returned. All is well. Yes, well enough, though we should not speak of that here. How are Athik and Aruna? cried Imoen. And Enric and Curry, added Fritha. Jahara swallowed the mouthful she had drawn and slowly lowered the flask. Fine, they are all fine. How did you know we were here? Continued Imoen, hopping up onto the wall next to Valigar. The druid shrugged, returning to Minsk's his flask. I did not. I went to the camp, first where I found our tents and a young man, Lukyle, who saw me looking and told me you were here. The camp there is sizable, Melison still commands quite a following. Fritha sighed. She gives them hope, who would not cling to that? Melison believes Sendai is gathering an army to the northwest. She had not heard of Abajizal and left here to make inquires into his whereabouts four days ago. We were waiting to hear back from her before we decided what to do, though with you returned and no sign yet of her, we may as well start out for Sendai, don't look so smug. She added sharply to a no-man's smirk. Will you take some ale? Offered Brianna, cutting off any chance for an argument. Jahara shook her head, narrowed eyes traveling the mercenary-packed courtyard behind them. No, thank you. So what has been happening here? Fritha sighed again, throwing her bag over her shoulder. Come on, I'll fill you in. They walked south until the street became more sand than gravel, before turning westwards to skirt the edge of the desert, that rippled expanse of yellow stretching off to meet an impossibly blue horizon. Fritha had paused to gaze across it, eyes shaded under a hand and narrowed in concentration, as though she could see something more within the golden dunes. Then a glance to her and look was gone, her smile shy and tinged with melancholy. How was the grove? Full of memories. Fritha nodded slowly, warm winds catching at the loose curls about her pearl-set ears. I am sorry about how things were before your left. As am I, Jahara sighed, I believed you corrupted. I let you believe it, the girl pressed, turning back to the desert with a sigh of her own. I needed you, Jahara, when we first met. And then later, you needed me, too, an unspoken trust between us that we each would protect the other, no wonder nothing's been right since the Harpers drove us apart. Fritha snorted, tired and faintly bitter, though the feeling fell away, lost to blazing honesty as the girl turned back to her. I need that trust back, Jahara, more than ever in the coming days. I am willing to give it, if you are. Jahara wanted to say the girl had always had it, but she had not, not completely, certainly not lately, the woman swallowed, fighting down that furious disappointment that, after all this time and the many years between them, it was still Fritha who always sought to reconcile them. And you shall have it. The girl nodded, turning to continue their walk, Jahara ready to return the conversation to less poignant matters. So, what else has happened here in my absence? I notice a gnomon and Brianna seem closer. She had meant to tease her, the druid frankly seeing nothing changed in the pair. Fritha smiled, fingers playing absently with the clustered jade at her neck. Yes. It is good they have found each other. I know you don't understand why, but a gnomon and I, 
we can't go back to what we were. Her throat bobbed, her words coming strangled through the welling tears, I watch them sometimes, the way she looks at him, like I used to, with an affection she can't yet admit. Yes, it will come right. Fritha turned to her suddenly, eyes wide with glistening sincerity, I know I never said it at the time, but I am so sorry you lost Khalid. Jahara was beginning to get tearful herself, hastily gathering the girl to her to cluck and fuss. There now, goodness, Fritha, where is all this coming from? Have you been drinking? A bit, she sniffed, wearing a grin that was quite at odds with the tears that still dripped from her tip of her nose. It merely struck me the other day I did not cry enough before, I was too busy trying to be strong for everyone, so I'm making up for it now. It is like I've suddenly become whole again, returned to that girl I was before Irenicus, before the asylum, and I look at the broken thing was, and I am so horrified, by my pain, the pain I caused. I cannot apologize, even when at my worst, I was trying, to remember who I was, trying to lead you as I should. I know you were, I know. Even until recently, I hated the world. It had disappointed me, what it demanded for what it was. But no, it is a fair trade. I love you, Jahara, please know that. Jahara was really crying now, the tears falling for more than just herself but for all those lost, lives extinguished in an uncaring world, and she pressed the girl to her, that deep, unspoken affection coming in a fierce hiss. Foolish girl! A long moment stood in that embrace and they at last parted, Fritha offering Jahara her handkerchief with a wet laugh, the girl unmindful of the less than practical color as she dabbed her own eyes on her fine white kurti. So, Jahara sighed, the pair wandering once more, what other tales do you have for me from my time away? Well, the girl began readily with her unwavering fondness for gossip, Valigar and Imoen are properly courting now. They share a tent and everything, oh, you should see them, all kisses and lingering looks, it's enough to make a Sunite sick. Solafane has taken to the loot with an envying skill, Minsk, bless him, seems to get more homesick by the day, I think it's the heat here, and that's it really. Fritha paused to send her another gentle smile, I'm glad you're back, Jahara. The druid felt her heart throb, arm thrown about the girl. Oh. As am I, child, as am I. The clatter of footstep fortunately forestalled another bout of tears and they turned to see Imoen red-faced and panting as she charged towards them, the girl skidding to a halt the instant they saw her. Oi, you two. It's Melison, she says she's got news. It was so and they arrived back to find the woman, as Imoen had promised. Their group moved from the wall and gathered about her in the shade of one of the empty houses close by, Melison seemingly reluctant to approach the inn, and Balthazar's mercenaries, any further. Ah, Fritha, she greeted at their approach, I have good news, and Jahara is returned as well, I see, greetings to you, Druid. Anyway, enough pleasantries, here, all the reports I have garnered on Sendai's location and forces, and here, a map to Abajizal's stronghold. Fritha gazed down at the two sheaves of parchment she now held, one tied in blue, the other, red. Just like that. Melison nearly lost her wimple with that furious toss of her head. What now? You asked me for the information and I found it. There is no pleasing you. Calm your pants, love, snapped Imoen, we just thought it would take you a bit longer. Well, Melison conceded, I must admit to having enjoyed quite a bit of luck, especially concerning the location of Abajizal. It seems a few of the local desert tribes have known of his stronghold for a while now, though they just believed him a jinn sorcerer of ancient power and kept their distance accordingly, they are a superstitious people. She smiled wisely. Truly, the fates are on our side in this. Frithis snorted. Oh ho, that they are. 
Where will you go now? Asked Solophane, Melison seemingly surprised to see the question directed to her. Will you remain here with the children? Oh, I would that were possible, they miss my guidance and Lucile frets over every little thing. But I have still to root out this last member of the five, they are lying low at the moment, likely waiting until all others are eliminated before making their move, but I am confident that the answers I seek will be found in the prophecies stored at the Holy Library of Watcher's Keep. I wish you well on the journey. Then, said Fritha. Melison matched her slight bow with one of her own. And to you, wherever you decide to go. The briefest glance to a no-man and Melison was off, sweeping back along the street, to turn the corner and be gone once more. She sets my teeth on edge, muttered Imoen, like eating sand. Mmm, Fritha murmured absently, where's Brianna? Inside, supplied a no-man, she went to get our flasks refilled, she likely guessed we would be leaving soon. And she was right. Come on. Fritha continued, as the woman herself appeared in the doorway opposite, it's late enough in the day that we can travel safely, let's get back to camp. And Imoen fell into step beside her, her wide smile taking on an uncertain edge as they pulled away from the others. Fritha, are you all right? You looked a bit upset when you got back with Jahara. You weren't arguing, were you? Fritha laughed gently and shook her head. No, not arguing. Good, cause I like you like this, all happy, and I don't want anyone spoiling it. They shared a smile, a peaceful silence holding them for a few paces more when... Fritha. Yes. What do you think I'd look like with brown hair? With half their belongings already packed up and carried with them for fear of thieves, it took very little time to dismantle the rest of their camp. Abajizal's stronghold was, in fact, not far from Amkathran, just under a ten days' journey south into desert. Lucile marking on the map Melison had given to them an oasis where they could likely find guides. A no man seemed to realize that they would be heading south without asking, and did not press his argument for traveling north to Sendai. And Fritha was glad of it, she had had enough emotion for one day, the night straightening to haul his heavy pack onto his shoulder. Right, if there is time, I will head over to the shrine here to make my prayers before we leave. Will you join me, my lady? Brianna blinked, seemingly caught out as she glanced up from her half-flattened tent. Ah, no, I fear I have too much to do here. I'll finish that off, Bri, offered Imoan cheerfully, she and Valigar carefully rolling up the canvas of their tent, just leave it. No, I would not wish to delay us. Fritha laughed brightly, carelessly throwing things into her own pack. We've time, yet, I must have spent days of my life sat on the wall outside the Temple of Helm waiting for a no-man. But Brianna remained firm. No, I do not need a shrine to make my prayers. My lord is everywhere. So it is, agreed Jahara. Not all who worship need a focus for their veneration. Fair enough, chirruped Imoen, see you soon, a no-man. The knight left them with a nod, Imoen skipping over to Valigar, the man struggling to push the rolled canvas into his already bulging pack. Here, let me help. He shied from her touch. Vals. Do you have all the pegs? He asked evenly. Imoen nodded, passing him the small linen bag. Yeah, I think so. He took it without a word, the girl sending an injured glance to Fritha who shrugged, no more idea than she, Imoen turning her attentions to the only men still left as Minsk and Solophane appeared, coming down the bluff with a staggered gait, 
arms straining under the two huge water flasks. Here, Sola, let me help you there. Another few moments packing, a no man returning to them with the stoic calm, his prayers often stirred in him, and as one they set out into the desert. Imoan pushed the linen scarf back from her head and shook out her hair, the roots tingling with this welcome release. They had walked well into the evening, stars blinking in the clear indigo sky to cast the dunes about them in silver, the heaped treasure of some absent lord, as though they had found camp in amongst a dragon's hoard. The night was still, a blessing since the dunes provided little cover. Jahara was already bent over a bubbling pot and trying to keep the all-invasive sand from their evening meal as she added the dried goat meat, the others about her busy erecting tents for the few hours sleep they would get, before the cusp of dawn would see them up and walking once more, their group forced to keep their travel to the cooler parts of the day. For a man more at home in the frozen tundra, Minsk had kept them on course and they would easily reach the oasis by the following day. As for that afternoon, Imoan was more than glad when the sun had finally relented to slip below the western dunes, rosy fingers lingering along with heat that would not leave air for a couple more hours yet. Her legs were aching from their trudge over sand, each footstep sinking deep under the weight of her pack, only to be hauled forward for the next weary step, all squinting in the glare. Fritha had wrapped her blue woolen scarf about head against it, Solafane and Brianna hiding under hats while Imoan had been sent over to visit Simon and the smugglers before they had left to get a selection of bleached linen scarves for the rest of them. At least, they had dispensed with their armor, not that Imoan usually wore it, but it was a pain to carry, her chain vest dumped along with their heavier items and a night's worth of firewood to be dragged on the travoy Fritha had borrowed from Lukyle. Imoan glanced again to the man just next to her his frown now on the canvas as he made to put up their tent. Valigar had been in a strange mood since they had left the village, though he would not tell her why, claiming it was nothing in a sullen dismissal that convinced Imoan only of the opposite. He glanced up to find her watching, no smile offered as he nodded to the bag at her feet. Pass me the pegs, please. Imoan felt she had been remarkably patient up to that point. She stooped for the small linen bag, pegs in hand and hand on hip. You're not having anything until you tell me what's wrong. You've had a face on you since we left Amkathran. It is not, her glare stopped him dead, the man conceding with a sigh. I am merely disappointed that, after all our discussions on the matter, you used magic for something so trivial. Imoen cast her mind back over the day and drew a blank. What? No, I didn't. You froze water for those children. A spell which was suddenly being worked on Imoen's stomach. Oh oh, yeah, I remember now. Vals, has all this been over some harmless cantrip any hedge wizard could have done? She sighed, a slight annoyance creeping in why he couldn't have told her this when she had first asked him. Well, you were right then, you are upset about nothing. Indeed. Imoen sighed deeply. Except you don't see it like that. Vals, what happened to you trusting me with the power I hold? Valigar sat back on his haunches, his stern face set. Yes. I trust you and we agreed your magic was important and could be used for great good, not wasted on foolish tricks to entertain local children. But it was nothing. As you say, but when it comes to magic, perhaps the question should not be why not? Perhaps the question should be why? Imoen threw up her hands, unwilling to argue so late in the day, however much of an idiot he was being. All right, Vals, I'm sorry. I didn't think. I'll be more mindful in the future. Valigar didn't look overly impressed with her dully muttered apology. Can I have the pegs now? Yeah, of course. Here. 
she threw them to land at his feet and left him to the task, her anger simmering forth in a low chuntor. Melodramatic bastard, you would think I'd have summoned a bloody ice storm. Trust me with the magic, yeah, as long as I don't use any. Imoen! Called a voice behind her, the girl turning back to see Fritha before her tent and beckoning her across, Solafane at her side, are you all right? What's wrong? Oh, nothing, just Val's is in a strop because I was messing about with magic earlier. Fritha frowned. When was that? When I froze the water. Oh, yes. Honestly, Imoen sighed, vindicated in her friend's disregard, I don't understand blokes. Well, don't ask me, warned Fritha, the only man who makes any sense to me is Solafane here. The drow in question looked rather touched. So are you going to apologize? Continued Fritha. Imoen shrugged. Already have, but he's still working the knots from his knickers, so I thought I'd let him get on with it. What are you two up to? Solafane carefully passed her the thin green folio he was holding, Imoen flicking through a half dozen pages all ruled with stave upon stave of music in the popular Cormyron scale. Fritha very kindly spent the last few days writing down some scores for me. It didn't take long, the girl dismissed, but the pink to her cheeks gave her away. Imoen laughed. Ooh, does that mean we'll be getting a little concert later? Maybe, if you're lucky. The chime of the cooking pot, Jahara stooping for the first of the bowls stacked next her. You three, the meal is about ready should you care to join us. Solafane and Imoen moved to sit, the girl pointedly picking a space as far from Valigar as was possible, Anomen and Brianna already settled side by side a pace from Minsk, while Fritha ducked into her tent to fetch her loot. Good Jahara, this meal smells so well, even Boo is tempted, enthused the Rashami as he received his bowl, brimming with the rich brown stew this praise echoed about the fire. Indeed, my lady. I, for one, am looking forward to this, a fortnight is too long without your cooking. You mean a fortnight is too long with Imoen's, quipped Solafane. Well, if you don't like my cooking, Sola, I'll gladly let you take my turns. The drow laughed. Only if I can make you Roth oil K. Oh, is that what we're having tonight? Came Fritha, finally finding a place beside him. You've tried Roth Jilk? Yes, it was served as part of a light supper at Feyre's after party orgy, quite nice actually, came with these thin seaweed crackers, but it left you very thirsty. Solafane was smiling eyes holding a fond regard as though another hundred years in her company would not be enough to discover every charming quirk. So, do you know what's it made from then? asked Imoen slyly. Fritha considered the point. No. Don't tell me. It tasted nice, that's all I need to know. The air was warmed by Solafane's mellow chuckle. Tell me. Fritha, what else did you try? Well, there were these pickled roots, I forget the name. Jirded. Yes, that was them, thank you, Jahara, oh, and I tried. A no man turned from them as they fell into talk of their own, the woman at his side catching his eye to smile tentatively and looking as though she was fighting against every urge to pull away as he moved to take her hand the man himself no more comfortable with the gesture for the fact he had instigated it. He had been spending more time in Brianna's company of late, visiting the tavern or just sitting together to share talk. Something they had always done, were he honest, though it was different now, 
something lingering behind each innocuous gesture. Her company was as pleasant as ever it was, and, he was guilty to admit, a nice distraction from current woes, but there was nothing more there, no affection long hidden stirring his heart. He saw the woman as he always had, a fine warrior and good friend, though whether or not Brianna herself felt this coolness between them he could not tell. She certainly did not press her company and perversely it was he who would suggest the walks out or try to catch her alone, the man frustrated that, even as she was fine woman of good character and fair features the feelings would not come. But with so many virtues to her, perhaps they would, in time. And there is your bowl, a no-man. Their hands parted instantly, a no-man murmuring his thanks as the druid handed a bowl to Brianna and returned to the fire to leave them both utterly relieved. A no-man fought down the lingering worries, so theirs would not be a courtship of such trivial gestures, it had no bearing on their feelings. Another faint smile between them, the woman seemingly much more at ease now both her hands were her own again, her eyes on her bowl as Valigar broke the silence. So, we will reach this oasis on the morrow and, with any luck, find a guide. And a camel, laughed Imoen, passed a mouthful of stew. Melison said the tribes here are wary of this stronghold, reminded Jahara, finally setting with them, they may not wish to travel there. Well, they can take us within a day's journey of the place, reasoned Fritha. I would imagine we should be able to make the rest of the way alone over so a short distance. Right. Minsk nodded to her glance. Have no fear there, young Fritha. And when we get there, pressed Brianna, we know this Abbe Gisel has the power to enslave dragons. Who can imagine what dangers his stronghold will contain? Fritha shrugged easily, if she felt any burden in their quest, she did not carry it on her shoulders. That may well as be, but the plan is the same. We will infiltrate his stronghold and eliminate him. As easy as that, muttered Valigar. Well, we can hardly put more of a plan together without seeing the place, can we? Snapped Imoen. But Fritha would let neither doubts nor squabbling permeate her air of assured calm. All will go as it should, this is where we're supposed to be, I can feel it. It seemed no one was willing to contradict the girl, whether they took this stance or not, their meal continued in mundane chatter about supplies and the weather. Imoen finishing first to wipe round the empty pot and refill it with water, and cups were brought out in anticipation of the tea that would finish the meal. Jahara leaned back against her pack, long legs stretched before her and cup poised at her lips as though she had never left. Shall we have a hand of cards, I left my talus deck with you, did I not, Minsk? Yeah, but let's have a song or two first, offered Imoen. The druid's eyebrows quirked in mild surprise. A song? Fritha is going to play for us. Not just me, Fritha trilled. Are you going to join in, Solafane? The eyebrows rose another half inch. Solafane? We have another budding artist among us. The drow snorted, pulling his lute onto his lap. I would not say so. Well, you are the only one who wouldn't, Fritha laughed, blithely chattering into her lute case. Solafane's really good, he's going to have to find a new teacher soon though, his talents will have well surpassed mine. Solafane's smile had taken on a wistful edge. You praise me like a matron's favored bed slave. And why not? You're my student after all. Your genius only reflects my own. A round of laughter, Frith is merry giggling electing a more genuine smile from the drow. Then I give thanks for this encouragement, my mentor, however underserved. Come on then, cried Imoen, give us a song. The pair obliged her, 
Fritha playfully reaching round to catch at the strings as Solafane made to tune his own instrument, and, at last, they began. A nomen turned away, his smile now back upon Brianna, the woman watching their resident minstrels with a frown, long fingers worrying the edge of the straw hat she had worn since they set out from Amkathran. It that not the bargeman's hat Fritha, ah, acquired in Indraviat. Yes. She lent it to me when we set out. It suits you. It keeps the sun off, she dismissed, seemingly wrestling with herself to add, but I thank you for the compliment. A nomen nodded, he did not feel much like offering another when she was in such an odd mood. Silence holding the pair as one song moved into the next, a interesting ditty about a maid of very loose morals and an enterprising nature of which Imoen, for one, approved by the way she was singing along. Ah, uh, I almost forgot, a nomen continued, reaching over to his pack, I have something for you. Here. He pressed the large sprig of dusky leaves into her hand, they were given to me by the priest who tends the shrine before we left the village. They smell of peppermint when crushed. I thought perhaps you may like to place them between your clothes to infuse them with the scent. Brianna leveled the leaves she held a liquid black stare. A nomen swallowed. Well, it is not much of gift. No, she cut in evenly, laying it within her open pack, it was thoughtful of you. He nodded the unease lingering though he made a show of sitting back and taking up his cup once more, Solafane's voice joining Frithas for the final verse. And when the maid her money got, she put it in her purse, and clapped her hand o'er the cellar, and swore it was never the worse. Imoen was laughing wildly. Ah, I love that song. I remember when we first heard it in the gate. Another, another. Imoen, calm yourself, sighed Jahara, and if we are going to have another, can we at least have something a little less crude? A glance between their two minstrels, as with many artists, Fritha was not one who took such criticism well. As you will it. My lodging it is on the cold ground, and oh, very hard is my fare. But that which troubles me most, is the unkindness of my dear. Jahara's frown was a fine accompaniment to this dirge. A nomen hid his smile in his cup. She often makes you smile. His eyes darted back to Brianna, guilt surfacing under her mild gaze. Fritha is amusing, he dismissed quickly, I would laugh similarly at anyone. So. Jahara was telling me our horses made the journey back with her and are now at the grove with the children. It is heartening news, is it not? Though my own horse was the orders and had not carried me for long, it does me good to think of the creatures living out their days in such peace. A brisk snort that rather put him in mind of the noble beasts. Really, a nomen, as though such matters in the greater tale, it is only a horse. Forgive me, my lady, I misjudged you. Your steed was your own, I merely thought you were attached to the creature. Her face crumpled, this glimpse of uncertain misery far worse than her temper, her voice quavering as she admitted, I was, to my shame. I should be above such foolishness, if they could see me back at the temple now. My lady. Brianna was on her feet before any other question could be posed, eyes following Fritha's fading form into the darkened dunes as their minstrels at last disbanded. I am sorry, a nomen, please excuse me a moment. Fritha The girl turned, her eyes easily making out the approaching figure silhouetted against the campfire she has just hurriedly left, thirsty as the singing had made her. She really should have paced herself with that tea. Brianna? Is something wrong? No, nothing, I merely, the woman hesitated, 
suddenly thrusting the hat she held to her, Fritha forestalling its return with a careless hand. No, you keep it. I have my scarf and, besides... She smiled, it suits you. Brianna nodded, though the frown remained, the woman fiddling uncertainly with the brim. I find we have not really spoken since our argument. Argument? When we spoke of a no man and the order's decision. I am sorry if I seemed brusque. It's fine, to be honest I had forgotten all about it. Fritha felt the smile waver, one aspect of it had yet to slip her mind though. How is a no man? Brianna shrugged. He does not speak of it, I believe he has accepted the matter as it is. The poor man, I fear I did not make his burden any easier either. All this while, I had been pushing you towards him, when in truth it was another you wanted. Fritha just caught her sigh. Look, I know what everyone thinks that Solafane and I are Soon's next victims, but we are just friends. So you do not love him? Brianna pressed. The girl shook her head, wishing she had the words to describe that complicated mix of emotions the drow stirred in her, that shared sense of unwavering loyalty, the feeling he would do anything for her and the implicit faith she placed in him. Brianna, you can't know what it's like. Solafane is my brother. We found each other in the darkness, and together we struggle on in the light. And a no man. I think it pretty obvious that whatever he and I had is well in the past now. Fritha forced a smile through the lingering ache, you know, I truly am glad to see you both getting on so well. But Brianna made no comment to that, saying only, he misses the friendship you once shared. And I suspect, perhaps, you miss it, too. Perhaps, shrugged Fritha giving up nothing of her feelings on the matter, but it is hard for us to find what we had after what has come since, and you need not worry about me, Jahara is returned and much less inclined to shout at me now, and I have Imoen, when she tears herself from Valigar's side. And, of course, I have you, Brianna. The woman straightened, a faint smile creeping in, as though she was embarrassed of her pride. I am honored you could consider me so and I shall endeavor be worthy of it and help you on your path as I first vowed. Fritha laughed, how like a Tormite to take on even friendship as a quest. Just be as you are, Brianna, just fight with me, and against me, when you think I'm leading us somewhere I shouldn't, and help our group to see this mess through to the end. She laughed again, giving a little hop from foot to foot, now, I've really got to go, I'm getting desperate. A voice in the darkness halted her escape. What are you two doing? Fritha shifted her hips and tried to redistribute be the building pressure. Hey Imoen, we're just talking. Weren't you playing cards? Yeah, but I soon got bored and Vals is still in a snit with me. Sometimes I don't think I'll ever understand him. Well. I must join you in that, offered Brianna bluntly, he knew you were a mage when you began your courtship and now he wants you to stop using magic. It's only because he cares. Fritha rolled her eyes. I thought you were cross with him. Imoen sighed, crossing her arms before her as though to physically repel this reason. Well, I am, but... Fritha. If you really liked someone, would you change so they liked you better? Imoen, this isn't about me, this is about you and Valigar. What's so funny? Imoen demanded of Brianna's warm laughter. The knight shook her head, still beaming. You ask your friend a question to which not only you know her answer, but your own as well. Fritha would not change for anyone and you should not either. Leave it to weak-willed farmers' daughters to fret and bend and concede everything they are to keep a man who claims to love them, 
I would die alone as I am, than live a hundred years in constant compromise. Well, I agree in principle, reasoned Fritha slowly, but people are so different, for relationships to work there usually has to be some concession somewhere. Brianna snorted. Then let it come from him. Amen, sister! cried Imoen, and instantly burst out laughing. Fritha just smiled. Well, that is one option. As for you, Imoen, I don't think anyone should change unless they want to. It is as Brianna said, life is too precious to spend it compromising your desires. And if you wish to develop your magic and Valigar wants you to, at best, ignore it, then I can't see how you can proceed as a couple. No, Imoen sighed, something about her slumping, I can't either, but it doesn't make me like him any less. Is this what it was like with you and Anomen? Fritha felt her heart sink. Imoen. Anomen and I, well, it was conflicted from the beginning, wasn't it? Because he has to go where the order tell him, and I want to go where, well, wherever I want to go. Well, it's hardly stopped him so far, the girl laughed. Fritha and Brianna said nothing, leaving Imoen to continue. I guess first off then, a no-man needs someone who wants to go where the order sends them. She threw a pointed look to Brianna. Fritha snorted. Mask's stocking feet, you're subtle, Imoen. What? What did I say? Brianna was inclined to see the funny side, the woman still laughing as she drew a large glass bottle from her bag. What have you got there, Bri? I bought it from the tavern when I went to have the flasks filled. Fritha's jaw dropped in her delight. Zaza's puree brandy? I love you. Get it open, then. She called back to them, already herring for the nearest dune. I'll be right back. When Fritha arrived back, they were already sat on the sand side by side, Imoen taking an enthusiastic swig from the bottle to gasp appreciatively. Bye, that'll put hairs on your chest. There you go, Fritha. Fritha sank a glup of the fiery liquid, the sweetness stealing the moisture from her mouth even as the heat faded. It's certainly strong. Brianna shrugged, receiving the bottle back for another sip. I found it quite smooth, but the only alcohol we had at the temple was made from the crab apples which we used for cleaning the stained glass, so I have hardly the most educated palate. You're making up for it now though, laughed Imoen. You never did tell me what you two got up to on that night in Dravayat. Fritha snorted. Because we all know what you were getting up to. Deboshed laughter from the two girls, Brianna indulged them with a smile. To be honest, I do not recall much of it. Especially towards the end. Fortunately, Fritha remembered enough to fill in the blanks. Well, let me tell you, Imoen, Brianna here was on form. She told a no-man she'd take him with us next time and get him a bit of kissing. Imoen laughed. I'm surprised you didn't volunteer yourself for that, Brie. Imoen. Cautioned Fritha. Imoen blithely ignored her. Is that what made you first leave the order and come with a no-man, cause you fancied him? Brianna tossed the braid over her shoulder with a haughty snort. You must think me a love-struck adolescent if you believe I would jeopardize a career in the Order on some foolish whim. I followed a no-man here, because I knew it is the place I should be. Fritha understands, do you not? You feel it even now, that every decision is the one you are supposed to make. Imoen just rolled her eyes and took another swig of brandy. Oh. Bloody hells, don't get her started, it was bad enough when the Sahuajin were all harping on about their blessed savior. 
Brianna was laughing. Ah, whatever comes, I am glad I met you, both of you, you opened my eyes to the possibilities for your kind. Do you ever wonder what life would have been like if you had not been driven from Candle Keep? Our kind, repeated Imoen, leaning back to take in the stars with a wistful sigh. I doubt our blood would have let us be, whether Saravak had kicked off or not. All right then, if you were not Balspawn. What, if we were just raised in Candle Keep? Confirmed Fritha, well, to be fair we didn't know we were of the children for a long while. I always wanted to travel, so I suppose I would have done that and then. She shrugged evenly, settle down, I suppose, if I'd lived long enough for the chance. I liked my theater well enough that it could have become my home. Aaron said. Aaron? Questioned Brianna. Fritha smiled at the memory of crinkled blue eyes. A man I knew once. A sailor, bit older than me, lovely smile. He said the theater suited me. It would have been a good life, just the right mix of drama and triviality and parties. What about you? What would you have done had you not been in the temple? Brianna paused, the bottle waiting at her lips. I do not know. I would likely be married by now with at least one child, if the women of the town were anything to judge by. So you couldn't marry as part of the temple? Confirmed Imoen. Did you have to take some sort of a vow of chastity then? Brianna barked a loud laugh. Certainly not. Though relationships were not encouraged, it was believed it took focus from the service of our Lord. When I was younger, I would sometimes sneak down to the nearby town for high harvest tide and other festivals, though I would receive a beating if I was caught. Ilmater's mercy, exclaimed Imoen, that's a bit strict. The woman merely shrugged. Perhaps. But I had only the plain brown robes of our order to wear and, as I was told many times, Torm is judged through his faithful, my behavior was to reflect this. As I grew older, I was given a little more freedom, though life was still quite regimented. Days of training or patrolling with the local militia, as well as attending services and performing my duties about the temple left little time for any personal pursuits, but it did not stop me from forging a relationship with one of the temple guards. Most of the clerics were older women, and disliked to leave the boundaries of the temple, and I would often tend the herds of goats we kept upon the hills. Solus would come up to meet we when he was off duty. It was pleasant, laying together upon our cloaks on the mattress of springy heather with just the sky above us and the distant bleeding of the herd. I remember the last time we met there. We lay together and I told him I was leaving. He said I was a fool, that I would come only to ruin. Brianna smiled faintly, perhaps he was right. But the decision was mine and I have no regrets. And what about you, Imoen, continued Fritha, going to become the next Lady Corthala? Her friend snorted, snatching up the bottle for another long draft. Ha! Huh. The way we're going, I won't be welcome to scrub his front step. Is that a euphemism? Imoen sprayed brandy into her lap, the three lost to laughter. A discomforted cough somewhere before them. Ah, Imoen. Their laughter came to an abrupt silence, the three straightening as one and Fritha's eyes could make out a dark shape emerging from the gloom. Vals. Can I speak with you, Imoen? Her friend sniffed and folded her arms. What about? Fritha gave the girl an encouraging shove. Imoen. Go on. Imoen shot her a sulky frown but conceded to heave herself from the warm sand, the girl brushing herself down to follow the man a few paces into the darkened desert until he stopped, turning to gaze down at her, all calm and solid just as she liked him for, and Imoen wondered if she could bear to end it whatever it came to. Not that he needed to know that. So, 
she began, cool and clipped, you wanted to talk to me? Yes, I wanted to ensure you are. She relented at his indecision. You could just say sorry, you know. Valigar sighed, scrubbing a hand across his face, revealing a weariness she rarely saw in him. I feel it is an empty sentiment. I am not sorry for my beliefs, but that they upset you. I understand you find them, and me, frustrating. That was why I did not mention it before, though I could not hide my feelings. I merely worry that if you do not see the dangers your magic presence, then I must be even more vigilant. Imoan shook her head, vigilance against what she was, and she wondered again if this whole relationship was not fueled ultimately by the man's desire for penance, Valigar determined to save another after he had been so quick to abandon his mother. I know you don't mean it, Vals, but at the same time, I don't understand you. You know I'm a mage, you've always known it, only a couple of days ago, you're asking me about coming to your house with you, but... She trailed off, that knot rising from her chest to block her throat as the realization dawned, this isn't going to work, is it? Valigar was as panicked as she ever heard him. I do care for you, Imoen, very much, despite... No, you don't, not as I am. Imoen drew a fractured breath and made her decision. As much as you fear it, Valigar... I'm a mage and I'm not going to ignore it or pretend I don't have that power or even restrict its use. You have to decide now. You have to decide what you want, and I won't be angry or hate you if we have to end this, but you have to decide now. I want to work with you, I want you to come to understand what magic means for me, and I want you to help me discover more. Even the gloom could not conceal that look of wary dismay. What do you mean? You had formal training in the art when you were younger, didn't you? Imoen pressed, feeling a mad elation at the impossibility of her request. Help me understand, give me some grounding to base my powers on. We can learn together, you'll be there, you can guard against any dangers and maybe, maybe you can come to see magic like I do. The man said nothing, his face giving no hint as to his thoughts, Imoen felt something inside her fate. She turned away, her friends and a bottle were waiting to console her. Don't worry, Vals, I knew it was a lot to ask. All right. She whipped back at the sound, Valigar stood so still Imoen thought she could have imagined it. All right. Yes, he continued stiffly, the words not coming without effort. I will tell you what I know. And I still carry my mother's earlier diaries, a reminder not to repeat the mistakes of the past, you may find something useful in them. The lump was back, choking her joy. Really, Vals, you're sure? No, he admitted with an sigh, but I will try. Calloused fingers gently brushed her cheek, I want to try. Will you come to bed now, it is late. Oh, Vals. She flung herself upon him to be lost in the warm enclosure of his arms. I can't believe, you said. Laughter in the darkness. Gods, Valigar, give her a snog before she bursts into tears. Imoen drew back with a wet laugh. Oh, shut up, you two. Come on. She tugged the arm that still encircled her. Valigar brushing teasingly at her tears as they turned to head for the bright point of light that was the campfire she had long left, the warm laughter following her. Ah, soon, you play a wonderful game. End of chapter